You're listening to Hungry for More, an Epicurean's Dilemma, and I'm your host, Trish Close. Today's episode is sponsored by Tap and Vine 559, the place to eat, meat, and drink in Southern Oregon. Jill Osier on the podcast today, and if you don't quite know that name, you probably should. She's the founder of Teneral Sellers, among lots of other things, like entrepreneur and public speaker. 100 Women to Know in America. In 2021, she won an award for Breaking Down Barriers. And that's exactly where this interview started right from the get-go. We talk a little bit about early career political fundraising and how an internship really set the path for her, uh, working for Special Olympics for about 15 years and all the work she did with that organization. But then really the theme of this interview was finding her place, her path, and what fueled her and all of the gifts that she brings to the table. We talk a lot about teneral sellers. Um, Teneral insect, just for background, is an insect that has recently molted its exoskeleton and it's left somewhat vulnerable. Well, the symbol for teneral sellers is a dragonfly. Teneral sellers donates 10% of its profits to organizations that empower women and promote gender and racial equality. I have to tell you, I love interviewing people, but I absolutely adore the interviews on this podcast. I'm left feeling lighter, supercharged, and mostly motivated and inspired. And today, this interview checked all of those boxes for me, and I hope it does the same for you. Here's Jill Osier. Looking you up, doing some research, usually when I introduce guests, I'm like, oh, it's winemaker so-and-so, or chef so-and-so, or they wrote a cookbook. Um, You, friend, were... (laughs) entrepreneur, public speaker, founder of Teneral Sellers, 100 Women to Know in America, uh, 2021 winner of the Women President's Organization, Adrian Hall Award for Breaking Down Barriers. I mean, overwhelming. I was a little overwhelmed. I'm like, I don't know where to start. I don't know what to write down. I don't know how to introduce her, but I just did. There you go. Welcome. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, Your story is really interesting, and I'm so excited I emailed you, it was a while back, and I said, Jill, do you want to be my podcast? And you wrote back, yes. And that was it. Hey, you know what? Just just saying yes opens the doors to so many opportunities in life. And I would I wish women would say yes more because I think especially, you know, I'm a mother of, of three children and so much of my earlier life was about taking care of them and growing, growing good humans. And, you know, I tried to do everything, but it was, it was definitely a challenge, but I realized as the older I get, say yes. You know, if somebody asked you to dance, say yes. Like if somebody asked you to go do something, say yes. Mm-hmm. You know, you, I mean, you just never know where life is going to take you and the journeys and the roads and, um, yeah, I'm at the point of my life where I'm saying yes a lot. I love that. Um, And I think, you know, saying yes, one of my things that when I look at when I'm doing some work and I always flip to this one page and one of my rules for myself is make the ask. So I love it when I make the ask and someone says yes. So I so appreciate Mm -hmm. the yes. Um, Well, can we just can we stay there for a second about the ask? Please. I don't I first of all, I don't think women ask for support enough, um, you know, in general. And And I also think it's asking for support, not help, because when you ask for support or you say, what can I do to support you? It's it brings people together when help is kind of puts you on in a defensive position. Like, I don't need help. I'm good. Mm. But it's also about asking because men ask all the time. Men ask, like, if they're raising money, if they need something. And I was just at a women president's organization conference and I was talking about where did we learn these stories about being so uncomfortable talking about money? Right. And even asking for money and asking for support, because if men were in the room, they would do that in two seconds. They would say, hey, I got a deal. You want in? You want to invest in this? You want to come in with me? And and we're like, oh, gosh, let's not talk about money. And but we have to change that. And and the way you change it is by asking, where do we learn these stories, these beliefs and um, and and rewrite that? Because, we're you know, we're 52 percent of the population. If, if women would literally just vote with their dollars and and support each other. Like we would shift billions of dollars in the economy today and and nobody can take that away from us. We have to fight for enough things in this world. But, you know, that is a simple thing you can do and you make the choice. You control that. And if we were more intentional and conscious about that, um, we could shift a lot of things. I mean, and it has a lot to do with why I started Teneral Sellers. It's like 70 percent of wine is purchased by women. Mm -hmm. 
and the industry doesn't come close to reflecting its largest customer. But we have to be conscious and intentional about that. And it's like when people say, oh, I'm already a member of Rewine Club. I'm like, well, how many of them are women owned and run? How many of them sustainably farm and produce wines? And how many of them give back 10% of profits to organizations that empower women and fight for gender and racial justice? So if you can't answer that, if you don't have a yes to that, you better you better drop one of those clubs and join my club. <laughs> that made me butt clench just a little bit. Like, <laughs> um, You know, that's one of your chakras talking to you uh-huh. right there. <laughs> Listen, that's a, that's a, listen here, listen here, open your ears. Um, and I think it is hard. I am guilty of this guilty as charged. It is so hard for me, even of my women friends to ask for help. And they'll oftentimes, what can I do? Can I help you out today? I know you have a busy day. Can I do something? Can I let the dogs out? Can I bring you lunch? And my first thing is like, no, 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 no. I can do it. I got it. Yeah. 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 So start, I, I love, you know, I, I usually up level with people to say, you know, start saying support and then ask your friends, say, what can I do to support you today? And then if they say, you know, or if somebody says, um, you know, can I help you? Uh, you know, just, it, just, I think it's a shifting of like the words we use mm-hmm. first and then, and then saying, yes, allow people to support you. Very good. That's, I, I like, I love that we're kicking this interview off on such a high positive point. Uh, Jill, where are you from originally? Born in Jersey, New Jersey, and then grew up in Orange County, moved there when I was seven um, and grew up in, uh, yeah, Orange County, and then came up to go to Berkeley, play softball at Cal in 1985. And then I've been in the Bay Area ever since. And then uh, moved up to the beautiful wine region of Fair Play in El Dorado County in 2017. And I, it's just beautiful country up here. Oh, man, it really is. Um, what was it like growing up in Orange County? Um, you know, it was a great place to grow up because it was, you know, it was safe, but it was, um, I don't know. I never felt, I never felt myself when I lived in Orange County. I always felt like I had to be something else. Um, and so when I moved up to go to, to, to Berkeley, to go to Cal, I realized that being in a, uh, a larger city in an area that had a lot more diversity and people could be real. Like I felt I could be, I could be real. And um, I didn't have to get dressed up to go get a cup of coffee and, you know, you do all of that. So I felt like I was starting to figure out like who I authentically was, although it's taken a lifetime to figure that out. So, um, but I, but I, I felt like Berkeley was, felt right for me. And I never wanted to go back to Orange County. Like just, I love, I I think the world's a better place when you have a diversity of thoughts and experiences. And I, I really got to live that when I moved up to Berkeley. I think, and even for me, what's bigger is not only the diversity of thoughts and people, but the acceptance that you're diverse in thinking and who you are or your friends are or whatever. The acceptance part of me because I, I grew up in South Carolina, and I'm not saying that it wasn't very accepting there, but there are certain thoughts and ideas in the South and um, wherever you are, really. But I, I think the acceptance part is what's always been a big deal for me. When you, I have a different opinion and someone goes back and says, oh, interesting. Thanks for sharing. That's yeah. huge to me. Yes, yeah, like we can agree to disagree, but we are accepting um, of of people's you know thoughts and experiences and feelings. Absolutely, yeah, and that's a great way to put that. And how is Berkeley? I love Berkeley. I think it's such a beautiful space in this universe. Yeah, you know, it was great. I you know I was playing sports, and and it's kind of all consuming. Um, I think I've learned to appreciate Berkeley more when I was out of, of Berkeley, just because I, you know, my, I was a catcher. So I wasn't only, you know, doing my own sessions and team practices, but then I had to do, you know, sessions with all the pitchers. And so um, it was all consuming and they didn't, they didn't, they now have more um, restrictions on how many hours you can practice um, in as a student athlete, but they didn't when I played. And so it was, it was year round all consuming. And so it was, but I still, I'm, I'm, you know, I got an amazing education and I, I had no idea what I wanted to do at the time. So I was a sociology major. So I learned I learned a little bit about everything. Um, and I had a professor, uh, Dr. Milos Mardik, who said, um, 
I want you to go to an internship with Senator Pete Wilson. And I'm like, I'm a Democrat. I don't want to do that. And he goes, it's not what you know, it's who you know. Go do the internship. And so I did that one summer. Um, and literally, I can mark a connection to that, to everything I've done since then, because Pete Wilson's chief of staff knew Diane Feinstein's chief of staff and made a call for me. I got an internship with her. And, and that was before she was that right after she left the mayor's office. And then she was going to run for governor. And um, and so I became her scheduler and everybody had to come through me. So I made a lifetime worth of connections. And then she won the primary and then wanted to move down to uh, Southern California because she wasn't well known there. And then I didn't want to move because um, I was engaged at the time. And and then I so I took over advanced work. So I learned to do advanced work. And then when I was doing advanced work is when I really fell in love with wine because I was seeing all these fundraisers and all this amazing wine. And I loved how wine connected people. I already had a love of wine, but that really sort of um, solidified it for me. And I think it was then that I kind of put it on my my vision board that I wanted to own a winery someday because I just loved how wine, you know, not only connected people, but you just relax a little bit and you open up and you have great conversations. And I know for me, the best conversations I've ever had, there's been wine, multiple bottles of wine on the table. So um, so I, yeah, I've always felt like, uh, because I'm, I love people and that, you know, what a, what a great business to be in. Uh, didn't know at the time how to get in there because I'm like, I wasn't, you know, I, I, I don't have, didn't have deep pockets, wasn't born into money. And so I was like, yeah. how, how in the world am I going to make that happen? Um, but here we are. So, um, and I also read that you early career, you did a lot of political fundraising. So I'm assuming it was around. Yeah. So then I, then I became a political fundraiser, got really burned out of that. I didn't, I, it, it just, it, I couldn't be it working in full alignment and integrity with my high, highest self. I mean, it, the, the, all the money rules changed and there was just so much greed and power. Yeah. Um, and I just, I, I, I couldn't, couldn't stay in there, but I took my fundraising and then worked, went to work at Special Olympics for 15 years. So I started up Special Olympics, Northern California, um, did the second national cause marketing campaign uh, behind Feed the Children. So we did one with um, Pacific Bell Wireless at the time, which then turned into Singular Wireless and AT&T. And like we did a $30 million campaign for Special Olympics um, where it called Give a Little, Get a Lot. And it was just amazing to to incorporate that into um, you know a, a normal marketing campaign. And I learned in the 15 years, it was a great place for my children to grow up. But I also learned that I... I didn't know at the time that I'm wired to be an entrepreneur. And so I was constantly feeling I was bashing my head against the wall. And like there was expectations that I would be standing around the cooler. And I'm like, well, if I stand around the water cooler, I'm not raising money. And then if I don't raise money, the organization doesn't function. So I realized once I did some professional training um, on myself and they, my board sent me to a a leadership training, the end of the, the week, the the literally the trainer that was assigned to me said, I think you should look elsewhere. <laughs> so I, but I, cause I realized then I could probably do more for charity outside of charity than inside of charity. And so, cause I've always believed in doing well by doing good. I mean, that's a model that I live by and, um, and it's a model that we do at general sellers of giving back 10% of profits. And so, um, so we bake it into how we, how we operate, but doing it in a more entrepreneurial way that uh, feels more aligned with who I am as a person. So you worked for Special Olympics, you said 15 years? Yeah. And you're essentially, I mean, what was your, I guess, title or role with Special Olympics? I was a uh, senior vice president of marketing and development. So I did all the marketing, all the fundraising. Um, I I wasn't the CEO, but I was the face of Special Olympics. I created major uh, celebrity events. We did a, I created a celebrity uh, um, Winterfest ski event in Tahoe that we we had uh, teams of corporate teams of ten, and there were eight corp corporate members, a Special Olympics athlete, and a celebrity, and we and people got to know each other over a three day period, and we had poker tournaments and you know fun rate or uh, live auction, and we had ski racing all day, and I mean it friendships that have lasted a lifetime from that and lots of stuff with the sports teams. Like we did a golf tournament with the Oakland Raiders for years. We did a, we did a casino nights with the Oakland A's. We did stuff with the, with the giants and, you know, just lots of fun things. But, uh, but I realized, yeah, I mean, it was, it was great to be there while my children were young, but it also, it just became more of uh, just, it, it, it wasn't me. I couldn't truly like thrive in a way and make the kind of impact I wanted to, unless I was, you know, left there and did it in a different way. Cause the organization was, you know, it's, it's all over the world, but it's very structured and right. um, I don't do well with structure. 
<laughs> I'm picking up on that. <laughs> yes, um, yes. The I, uh the disrupt the the disrupt excuse me, disruptor in me. Yes. Yes, yes, for sure. I guess were you after that, like as you were nearing the fifteen years, were you feeling kind of like itchy like you're like i gotta oh i gotta get out of here yeah and that's when my i asked my board if they could send me to this leadership training and they did and um and i think when i started to do more work on me on uh, figuring out my own leadership style and and how i show up in the world is when i really realized that i i can't thrive in that environment anymore um and it because it was just um it, it was really boxing me in quite frankly mm -hmm. and so um, and I, at the time I'm like, where do I go from there? I mean, there's no better nonprofit because in my mind, I was, I was still thinking nonprofit, uh, like I would be in that world. And then I just, it's funny when I left, I was open in 15 years, there was, my phone never rang. I mean, I had an amazing board that I helped, you know, curate. I had winery owners. I had mega CEOs from huge companies on my board. Um, but never, never anyone, no one ever poached me. And then all of a sudden when I left and when I was open, like my phone started ringing, like people out of the blue were calling me and going, Hey, have you ever thought about working for this or that? And I tried a few things. Um, and then I got um, a call to start up a, a tech company and, um, and took the jump and I ran a company and unfortunately the, the you know, 08, 09 crash happened, but I learned a lifetime worth of lessons because um, it's important who's in the trenches with you when stuff gets, when things get tough. Um, and the two owners of that company ran for the hills when the economy crashed, left me holding the bag. And, um, and I talk about it because it really, it, it's, a, it's a really important stepping stone in my mission, in my, in my path, uh, because, um, because there was a, a CFO at the time that was on loan to me. And then he was, he was there to support me. Um, and then we, we ended up starting a business together where he's the one that I got into the wine industry with. And, um, but I've also learned over the years that the universe keeps putting the same thing in front of you until you actually fully deal with it because he was there in the moment, but he, he was also, um, you know, he, he's a, he's a nice narcissist and I've had a, I've had a history of having nice narcissists in my life. And so, um, and I left that company with him, the wine company in 2020, because when the crisis of COVID hit yeah. and when, um, you know, the unrest in this country after the murders of Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery and George Floyd, I was just sitting at my desk saying, what was I doing as a leader in the wine industry to, um, be part of the solutions that I wanted to see. And I realized that in this other wine company where I was one of the three major owners, I was leaving the best part of myself at the door every day to make my male partners happy. And um, and so it, it unfortunately it took the crisis of that for me to realize, like, I know I was meant to use my voice. I know that, um, you know, I've always used my voice. I've always been on the front line of protests and um, and, you know, standing up for what's right. And here I was, had become very tamed in this industry that's so steeped in tradition and dominated by men. And, um, and it was, it was time. And like the second I gave myself permission, it's when like 10 year old sellers literally came pouring out of me in an instant. I hadn't even given an, an ounce of thought and, but it was clearly percol you know, percolating in, um, yeah. you know, in, in the back of my mind and gave myself permission. And then here it came and it was pouring out of me. And it was just, yeah, pretty, pretty amazing when I think about like, no, nothing to something literally in, in seconds. Yeah, no. And it, that reminds me of being, like I mentioned in the news business for almost 20 years. And I was getting to the point where I couldn't tell the stories I wanted to. I was having to tell the stories that my bosses that didn't even live, did, weren't even in the newsroom. They were in other cities controlling other newsrooms. It was, it was the stories they wanted me to tell. Right. And I just got to this point where I was planning on leaving anyways, but it's like, thank you for helping me out the door. I so appreciate that. I wanted to tell stories about winemakers and dogs needing to get adopted. Like that's what I was wanting to do. And I just didn't want to have to tell a story that first of all, just didn't even really apply to our region or my community. And it just didn't make sense. And I do feel like the universe is like giving you signs and things now's your time. Now's the time to make a change and make a move. Yeah. Well, and it's interesting. I mean, I'm, I'm a firm believer in energy. Energy is everything. Um, and the more internal work I've done, um, has really helped me get to where I am because, you know, I, I was 
in my head all the time. Like I, my, I, you know, I, I wasn't feeling enough in my body at the time um, when I was at this last winery and my heart was speaking to me, my gut, you know, the woman's intuition, they don't call it a man's intuition. And what I now know about our heart and our gut is they are technically two brains, just like your head is a brain. And women in particular, you know, when our, our gut fires first, it literally sends signals to every single cell in your body. There's 45 million trillion microbials in your, your gut that act as, as brains. And so, you know, I was getting all these signals. I wasn't paying attention to them. And so then I would use my head to talk myself out of what I was feeling. And, and the more I did that, I actually, I would get really tight in my throat because I wasn't speaking my truth. And, um, and so it was interesting when I decided to leave this last winery and start Tenoral Cellars for the first time in years, it was like, all of a sudden it went click, click, click. And all three things just went in alignment. Yeah. And, and it was like, I could show up now as my highest, most authentic self and operate in my brilliance. And what I mean by brilliance is that I could now operate in full alignment and integrity with my highest self. And I couldn't at the other company. And, and so, um, and it did, and then it didn't matter for me. Like it didn't matter if I was making the toughest decision in the world. I knew I was acting in full alignment and integrity with my highest self. And when you do that, like the world needs women in particular to, to figure this out. And then I speak across the country now about this, because if we're going to truly be leaders and get more C-suite positions and get more board seats, we still have to show up and speak our truth. It does. There's no impact that's going to be made if we're sitting at the table, but we're not using our voice and, um, and speaking our authentic truth. And if we're going to have more healing in this country and we're going to you know, get rid of the divisiveness, women have to show up. And I'm feeling from so many women in my life that they are being called to do this. Now, this year more than ever, um, it's like pandemic's over, women are being called uh, to step up and and it's important. And, and I have found that as I have found my true self, I've also been attracting my true people. And so like the people that I'm attracting in my life are amazing healers and people that have so much to contribute to the world. And then I wanna use wine as that conduit for change so that when we open a bottle, we open the necessary conversations, which is why we do different themes every quarter around women's empowerment issues and select amazing uh, causes that are making the impact but then when we open those bottles, we can actually have these conversations, whether it's about menopause, whether it's about women's health issues and the lack of funding and the lack of equity in healthcare in this country, or it's about Title IX and still the work that has to be done so that people aren't discriminated based on the on, on sex or their gender. And um, you know, our Love is Love collection and you know, you know, supporting the Stonewall Inn Gives Back initiative because they're creating safe spaces around this country for members of the LGBTQ plus community. We need to talk about all of these things because um, for me, it's about sticking to your values and your core beliefs and living that every day. And, and we try to do that with our wine brand. And obviously the wine has to be great and we make great sustainably farmed and, and produced award-winning wines, but it's really about how we're, I'm using wine as to, right. to make the kind of impact that I want to make in the world so that I can do what I love and love what I do. I also think it's important you hit on this, and I'm sure you'll agree with me, using your voice, you have to go get it, right? It's not necessarily going to come to you. If it does, you're very lucky. But if you're not going to just open your email and there's going to be 20 emails in there asking you to be involved and do things, you have to go get it. If you want something, you have to go get it. Yes, absolutely. And for me, when I started Tenoral Cellars, I realized like if the wine industry isn't representing its largest customer, which is women, there's only 10% female winemakers, 0.1% black winemakers, men and women, female sommeliers on the most part are still making 70 cents on the dollar to their male counterparts. Yes, you will find women in tasting rooms. But when you look at the industry as a whole, there are very few women in leadership positions and even fewer women of color. And so I thought, well, if I want to reshape the wine industry to represent its largest customer, which is women, how do I do that? Right. And, and I had to be very disruptive in that everything we questioned everything as we were launching, as we were building. It was like, what does disruption look like? So, so somebody said to me, well, you have you have all these vendors and suppliers that are women and minority owned businesses. Well, what about, you know, what about taking, you know, having men or something? I said, well. So I said, it's like when RBG said, Ruth Bader Ginsburg said, was asked, when will there be enough women on the Supreme Court? And she said, when there are nine, because there's been nine men. So why not have nine women? Right. And and I think about like, I don't want to be 
carbon neutral, so to speak? If I had 51% women and minority owned suppliers and vendors, am I really impacting anything? Um, and for me, this is one of our uh, releases, this Disrupt Now 208. So I ask women and people when I talk, I'm like, do you know what 208 means? And most people don't. And there's the glo the um, World Economic Forum study that says, while we are, as women, are more motivated than ever to fight for equality, if we don't do things disruptively different, it will still take 208 years in this country for women to achieve full equality. Add equity in there, the number's bigger. Add the overturning of Roe last year, God knows where we where we are. And so, so I, I the, this is the reason this bottle is on my desk. The only wine bottle I have on my desk is because I want to. I need to be reminded every day what does disruption look like. And so, all of my vendors and suppliers are women and minority-owned companies. You know, we um, and that wasn't easy to find. It wasn't easy to find a label company that was women-owned. It wasn't able, easy to find a fulfillment house that was women-owned that does wine. And um, so, at every level. We are intentional about that, and so it's it's important. And you know, we're intentional about who we hire and um, and what we look like, and uh, you know, from from a beautiful diversity of voices and experiences, so that we could truly reflect all of our customers. And and we love good men too. I mean, it's really and we have a lot of great men who buy our wine and gift it to the important people in their life. And people love to take our wine to parties because there's a great conversation starter on the back of every bottle. And um, and you want to have a great party just open the question and, you know, or read the question and open up the conversation mm -hmm. and open up the bottle and pour me a glass. Yes. Amen to that. That's my number <laughs> one rule. Let's go back just a little bit. You're leaving special Olympics. And then I, I guess I just want to hear how that journey started from, you know, sort of the nonprofit side to now this winery that you helped, you helped. Yeah. Out. So, so then I went and ran that tech company, the economy crashed right. and then the partner, uh, the CFO who was kind of stuck in there with me, we, you know, from the first day we met, we talked about wine and he had taken the largest nut company in the world public in the UK and was big time into wine and farming and had experience in that. And we, um, we decided to start up a consulting company um, that would help uh, double and triple bottom line companies get off the ground. And so we did everything from helping them do their business plans to financial modeling to, um, um, helping them raise money. And then we would be their core team to get them up and running. And then once they're up and running, we would help them hire staff and, and they could take it from there. And so we helped about not, I think we did nine, nine to 11 startups get off the ground, but it was interesting during that process because it's like the universe kept saying, why do you keep building this for other people? Like, why are you doing that? And, um, and, and then we, we, one of the companies we started was a, um, a wine distribution company because when the economy crashed distribution changed like the the big boys gobbled up all the medium-sized distributors and then there was nobody left to really support the 97 percent of wine brands that make under you know 10,000 5,000 cases a year right there's only there's like three percent of wineries make or, or make over 50 or produce over 50,000 cases and the core of those are like the big, big boys that produce millions of cases, but they own a lot of labels under them as well. Like I tell people, you know, if you go to Safeway, you know, about 95% of the wines are owned by like five companies on that shelf. And, um, you know, but they just own all the labels and you don't know that you're seeing them as different, different labels. So, um, so we did that. And what we, what we quickly found out was that we would do a great job of building somebody's brand from like 200 cases to 10,000 cases. And then they'd walk in our office and say, thank you for building my brand. We're now going to go leave and be with Southern Wine and Spirits or Glazers or somebody like that. So we had no control. And so um, at that point, we had grown a, um, a winery called Micah Cellars, and he was based out of Santa Cruz Mountains. And we got to know him well, and, and he realized that he hated the business side of it. So in 2015, we made him an offer to buy his company um, and he would stay on as the farmer and the winemaker because he was a geologist first before he was a winemaker. His family had came from a family of geologists. And so he knew the dirt. And and then we looked. Um, so we acquired that, that in late 2015. And then in early 16, we started looking at every wine region in California. And we had a Cal intern that did research on all the different uh, regions. And El Dorado County just kept screaming at us. Um, the dirt was amazing. Uh, soil was phenomenal. No water issues. 
no production restrictions. So people don't realize like you could go spend $10 million in Napa and they'll, they'll restrict you to producing 5,000 cases a year. And we were already way over that. And so with, with Micah Sellers, um, there's no water issues. Uh, El Dorado County actually owns its own federal water rights. And in the last seven years of drought, they were selling water to other, uh, other counties. And so we live off of well water and um, that's fabulous. And then just the cost of land. I mean, I think when the 08, 09, you know, the 09 crash, um, when things started to recover, uh, they didn't recover in this wine region. And so, um, you know, prices started to, to return in like El Dorado Hills and and greater Sacramento and Folsom, but not in not in the country where we, we were. And so we actually started looking at there might be an arbitrage here. And um, we realized like how how, um, you know, $28,000 for an uh, acre of income producing vineyards right next door in Amador, it's about 100,000 in Napa, it starts at 350. And so which is why people can't make money in Napa. And it's just the the, the finances aren't there. That's why most people, you know, you see all these new gorgeous tasting rooms, they're, they're being built for, you know, trophies, right? Somebody who's had an amazing life, and they want a trophy. And if they break even great, if they lose a little money, great. Uh, it's no big deal. But, but we were in this to make money. So we were looking for the right region. And and then just the climate. I mean, El Dorado County, you could grow everything around the Mediterranean. So all the French varietals, the Portuguese, the Italians, you know, Spanish. And so so we moved up here. And um, and then when we realized how the arbitrage, we started buying land and started doing our own farming because we also realized the farmers up here, they were using people from Napa and they were having a lot of mildew and mite issues because they weren't even looking at UC Davis to see like, we're, we're not Napa. We have a different climate than Napa. And so, um, yeah, so so that's how we, um, when we started buying that, we started building brands and we had three brands under this company. So we started with Micah Sellers, but then we bought a tasting room and open Mediterranean vineyards. And then we bought another, got another tasting room and, and um, had 1850 wine cellars. Um, and so we we grew that company pretty big. Um, but that's when I, you know, the bigger we got, I realized that my partner, Paul and I, we were like the two-headed monsters with our leadership styles. Like he's from the UK and leads by, chain of command and I'm a athlete. So I'm all let's collaborate and co-create and teamwork. And so it, it, we were not, we were not good together. Um, but I learned a ton from him because he was a chartered accountant and a CFO and a trained attorney. And so again, the, the experience was, I needed that experience, but I also needed to, to learn enough and have enough experiences to realize that I didn't need him. I, I could do this on my own. And, and, and that's when everything again, hit in, 2020 was when I realized like it's time for it's time for me to do this mm -hmm. in the way that I really want to lead and I want to lead from my heart and I want to build a beautiful you know collaborative team and let people shine in their own skill set and not not be chain of command I, I like that doesn't work um, and there's enough there's enough studies now to show that people can't thrive when there's you know chain of command in that way not in a creative industry like the wine industry when it's all about hospitality and it's all about experiences and it's all about Absolutely. lending that beautiful art and science to do amazing things well you needed that experience so you could break away from that experience yeah right? exactly yeah. yes yeah and yeah. i think yeah. um you know that's that's one thing i know oregon struggles with and i think all wine regions honestly struggle with is identity you know, in Southern Oregon, when I tell people, yeah, we have wine country in Southern Oregon, they're like, oh, you guys make great Pinots. And I'm like, no, 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 no. That's Willamette. That's up north. Or, oh, you do these wines. I'm like, no, 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 that's Napa. So I think it's important to, when you're talking about identity with a wine region, you really want to make sure you put your stamp on on your wine region and what it is and explain all of that. Um, I mm -hmm. want to talk about Teneral Cellars. Uh, but first, a quick message from today's sponsor. We'll be right back. Welcome to Tap and Vine 559, the place for that drink after work. Choose from a long list of local wine, craft beers, and ciders on tap. The place for lunch or dinner, shareable bites, fresh salads and bowls, and mouth-watering sandwiches and entrees. Come with a friend, the family, or book Tap and Vine for your next party or event. More information at tapandvine559.com. Tap and Vine 559, the place to eat, meet, and drink in Southern Oregon. May I ask what the name of the company was that you left? Yeah, it was uh, it was Gold, Gold Line Enterprises. Gold Line Enterprises. And I read that there were, you had three other partners or just one? I Two. Thought 
There was so, well, one one major partner, and then the uh, their biggest investor was also like the third. So yeah, it was like three uh, three major owners. Yeah. Okay. And you were just done. <laughs> you were like, peace out. Well, I mean, well, here here's here's here was here was my ending point. So after the murders of Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery and George Floyd, I approached the executive team, which was myself and three three men, and. And I said, we need to do a Black Lives Matter post because we have a diversity of investors, we have a diversity of employees, and we have a diversity of customers. Yeah. And and so I said, why don't I craft something? And then if we're all okay, we'll post it. So I, I drafted something. Uh, we Everybody said, yes, we posted it. And the next morning I got up and I uh, opened my computer and there was this email from our largest investor and it was sent to the four of us uh, or the three of us, the other um, two guys and myself, but it only said, Dear Jill, how dare you post this Black Lives Matter post? This political post is going to damage me personally and professionally. And if you don't remove it, I am going to ask for your resignation. And if that doesn't work, I'm going to hire attorneys to sue our own company. And so I... Um, obviously responded saying this was a statement of humanity and we um you know we we have a diversity of investors and employees and and customers and it was interesting because the week that followed was a very interesting one because the wine bloggers actually praised us for being one of the very first wine companies to take a stance um we did have a few wine club members that quit because they must have been drinking the same Kool-Aid that our investor was in that if we support black lives matter that we don't support law enforcement and if anybody looked at our activity in our community we were one of the biggest supporters like we do fundraisers all the time to support you know our our police our fire our first responder everybody and so um so then at the end of the week he kept demanding that we take it down so we had a board meeting and we agreed to keep the post up but we also agreed that we would never use our voice again and obviously i was the only dissenting vote and 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 i was proud that we took the stance that we did um and when i when i heard that we were never going to use our voice again like that like i could just feel yeah. it in my heart right now um i i just said you know what that's when i'm like I, I can't do this anymore what am i doing as a leader in the wine industry to be part of the solutions that i wanted to see and that's when I gave myself permission. That's when I found the, the, the statistics on women in wine. It's when I found the, the World Economic Forum study on the 208. And, and then all of a sudden it came pouring out of me. And, and one of the reasons I chose the dragonfly is because the dragonfly represents the transformation that I want to see in the world. And it reminds us to be the light. And the word tenoral is when a dragonfly comes out of its cast and it's in its most vulnerable state. Its wings are colorless and it can't fly. And within a few days, it gets its full colors in its wings, spreads its wings, and takes off with amazing power and grace or grit and grace. And that represents all women to me. We have that power within us. We just have to claim our own power and spread our wings and fly. And I was that vulnerable dragonfly. I was stuck in a position where I was leaving the best part of myself at the door every day, and I needed to claim my own power. And so... You know, I left that company in June and we opened the doors of Tenoral Cellars virtually because we I started as an e-commerce brand only because we were in the middle of, you know, beginning of COVID. Um, but we launched October 1st. So all of this came out of me. We got wines produced. We got everything up and running and we opened our doors on October 1st of 2020. And 2021, we broke the million dollar mark in our first full year selling online. And we did that again last year. Um, but then I realized that now that we have national presence, we um we need we need a physical place because people want a place to come in purpose and to gather and and I want a place for people to come in purpose and experience great wines and connect and I want to be able to have different converse, community conversations every quarter on our different releases and um so last year I started setting the intention that that I need a physical location I need um you know not just to be selling online we were doing a lot of virtual wine experiences so we do a lot of experiences that include diversity, equity, and inclusion training. And I've got a great team that does that, um, someone that's certified in de &I, and i um, And so we've done a lot of great, we still do great virtual events because that, that's not going away. Right. Um, and, and, and then I'll partner with like the San Francisco Cheese School, which is a women-owned business. Or, or I'll bring you know, Chef uh, Tanya Holland on uh, from Brown Sugar Kitchen and, and, to, and we'll do collaborative things together. And um, 
So we're always trying to showcase and elevate other women as, and we use different women on all of our labels so that we can showcase different um, artists. And we've had different chefs that, that pair food and, and great recipes with us. And, but um, we're now, you know, we're getting the keys to a, a new home tomorrow in Amador County. Woohoo! And, breaking news. Yeah. Yes, it is breaking news. So it's, we have a gorgeous 40 acre property, 26 acres of vineyards. There's a full production winery, a gorgeous Tuscan tasting room and a six bedroom, five star boutique hotel. And uh, which is Stunning for weddings and events. And I mean, I know all my women presidents organization sisters already are like, let us know when you <laughs> have the keys because we're going to book our C-suite retreat there. We're going to book it for a family weekend. And um, and the couple that's retiring, I mean, it's just so rare that you get an amazing opportunity and we're acquiring their existing great business. And, um, and so, mm-hmm. yeah, like we'll post this in like two days on our website and now people can come visit us in Amador County and it's the former Wilderotter property. Um, and, um, and, and they're there, they make phenomenal wines, award-winning wines. And so um, we'll, we're going to transition slowly um, because they've got a great following and we, we want to honor, you know, the history of what they've built and their legacy. And they're going to continue to live in the community. So we want to respect that and, um, and do it in a really beautiful way. And so, um, yeah, couldn't be more excited to now have, you know, when people calling all the time, Hey, we're in town, we want to come visit them. Right. Like, I don't have a tasting room. Right. So. Well, I think first of all, that was the universe talking, right? The universe is like, here you yes. go. Um, but I think when you support a cause or a business, you want to support it in all the ways. And so I think people want to be able to go somewhere physical and like actually like show you, Hey, look, I'm buying a bottle now. I'm drinking a bottle now. I'm taking bottles home. Like, I think you just want to show that you're so in support. Well, and, and I, you know, we want to give great experiences and what I did on this property, I was very intentional. I didn't want to do it by myself. So I brought in a business part, partner. Her name is Tracy Prigmore. She's an award-winning real estate developer and a hotelier out of Virginia. Um, I met her through Women Presidents Organization and the, uh, and the Bow Collective, which is the uh, Black-owned women business collaborative. Um, and then we we said we wanted to um, give women an opportunity to come together to build wealth through real estate and be part of the collective economy. And so we have like 54 investors in this property. It's a property fund that we created and all but three are women. And, um, you know, and so it's really amazing that we're doing this in a collaborative, collective way, because all of these women will also be great ambassadors and, and uh, you know, and help us build this brand. And so that that really feels right for me when, when we can do things like that, because getting again, getting women involved in the collective economy is so important. Right. And so many women never have had the opportunity to invest and be part of something like this. So it's been really fun to see how many people like this is their first investment and um, and and going through all of this. So it's really exciting to just see who we've been able to bring on board and and get get women to be part of this. And they're going to get great returns over a five year period on this property fund. So the wine that you'll be making, so this will, the property will turn into Teneral Cellars. It will. Yeah. So we're going to transition that, but there's inventory that's coming with this that's already labeled. Sure. Um, and again, people don't, the existing um, clientele, people don't like change, right? Um, in general. What? Uh, I'm okay with change, but uh, yes. But but so we want to do it slowly. So we'll start to incorporate some of the, you know, the Dragonfly labels into the right. tasting room and do some things, you know, that are strategic. We'll start to give everyone amazing experiences they didn't really do a lot of uh events there and you know even music in the tasting room and all of that is i mean the place is so gorgeous that um i can't wait to bring in you know so many amazing artists and musicians and comedians and like i work with a my good friend owns the laugh cellar lisa pidge and she does all she all they do is wine and you know and comedy and so she's got an entire book of female comedians that I want to bring and do great events. I have chefs that want to come and do chef and residence programs because the inn has a whole display kitchen, um, not to mention a full chef kitchen, but we could do cooking classes and Mm. just great experiences and cook, obviously cook for people as well. So there's just so many things that that I want to do to create amazing experiences for people and get them, get, you know, give them an opportunity to know our brand and taste our great wines. You know, it's, um, Speaking of change, my mom's always told me the only thing you can depend on in life is change. And so I always I always kind of fall back on that. Like that's actually comforting to me that 
things are always changing. So if you feel like you're stuck, don't worry. It will change eventually. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm wife- good with change too. So I don't have any issue with change. I, I mean, I think I, I, yes, I, I do love change, but sometimes change can be scary. And I was going to ask you when you were on this adventure of Teneral Sellers, were you scared? Was it ever scary? Um, yeah, you know, I mean, it's, it's scary to take the leap of faith, but I also, but you know what, I I've done enough internal work that I know when that creeps up, um, it's, it's ego. And, and then I have a nice conversation with that. It's like, um, you know what, but I'm betting on me. And, um, and every time I've taken a leap of faith, I figure it out. I have a, I'm a connector. That's one of my superpowers. And if I don't know something, I know someone who does know that. <laughs> and, um, and I've realized in life, and it's a, a great lesson, everyone is, is who's in your personal cab- cabinet, right? Like, and, and I have, I have friends that don't know business um, that are there that I, that I can count on emotionally. Uh, then I have like the most amazing, you know, network of people that I, I if I need expertise in finance, I have that. If I need law, I have that. If I need real estate, I have that. If I need, um, you know, I don't know, modeling, you know, financial mo- or whatever, I, I've got someone for everything. And and even even like on the social stuff too. So I put an advisory board together for Teneral Sellers that is amazing. It's some of the most amazing women you'll ever meet. And, um, and I rely on them, they, you know, to get the support that I need. And I, I realized that that is, you know, having that gift and not using it, um, you know, and having all these amazing people, right. like, I, I almost from a selfish perspective, like the, the growth that I've done since I started Tenoral Sellers, because these amazing people I have around me, and like these conversations I have on Jill with Jill and our general talks. And like, I, I, my life is better because of the conversations that I'm having with all these other experts. Um, and then we get to share it with other people, but you know, I've, you know, I'm in my menopausal years. And so like, we'll have, I have the most amazing experts where we are saying we're in the prime of our life. We need to be talking about this more. And people are talking about it now. I mean, you even see Oprah now is doing a huge thing on menopause all the time. And um, but you have millions of women every day going in and out of menopause and we never we never were talking about it and we're in our prime. And so it, it's just things like that. And I just realized that I, um, you know, I, I've got amazing people. So I, I I had nothing to be afraid of because I know I know it's needed what I'm doing. Um, I know it's my calling to do what I'm doing um, and to make an impact for women in this world. And so. Um, I have to rely on that. And I, um, and, and so sometimes I just got to say, thank you. You're not needed here today. <laughs> you go away now. Yes. Goodbye. <laughs> Bye. Um, Bye-bye. who, so this new site that you're having, there's already grapes on site. You'll be, pro- oh, yeah. you'll be producing wine from those grapes. From those grapes. And then I'll bring my grapes from my vineyard over there as well. But will everything moving forward will be produced out of that winery, uh, full production winery. I mean, it's got state of the art, everything, awesome. including a, an amazing bottling line. So we could probably bottle for other people in the community as well. Ooh, maybe a startup. Yeah. A little oh, yeah. No, we're going to definitely do custom crush for people. There's no question. That's amazing. Um, yeah. What what I really appreciate in just the last ugh, 46 minutes that we've been chatting, you know, you'll see it a lot, especially on social media. There's people who, and you know, women, men who say, I support this. I support women owned business. I support this, but it's just talking, right? What I appreciate about you is that you're actually walking the walk as well. So you're not just saying, you know, we, we support, you know, black owned businesses or, or, or black winemakers or women winemakers. You're actually like employing these people and you're actually like bringing them in and, and creating change and creating opportunities for women to invest, for instance. And so I just appreciate that. I wanted to mention that it just hit me. Like you're not just saying the things you're doing the things. So thanks. Thank you. No, I, yeah, you're welcome. I appreciate that. Thank you. And, and you know what, it's, it feels, it feels good when you can, you can live in your truth and walk in your truth. And, um, and it's, um, and, and I also realize how, hungry other women are Mm -hmm. to be able to participate and to, to, you know, to show up to things like this and be part of it. And that warms my heart when I can, if if I can be a reason that people come together um, and it's not about me, but if, but if I can, if I can help build community and if I can help people thrive in that community, then, um, then that's a beautiful thing because when you see people truly thriving, uh, there's nothing more beautiful. 
Right. And there's an organization here in Oregon, Women in Wine, that I'm a part of. And it's so incredible to see women in the industry. So you have winemakers, wine shop owners, you know, marketing folks like myself. I mean, it's just so nice to see these women come together. And, you know, we're networking, sure. But we're also just like telling stories and drinking wine. And just yeah. there's fellowship. There's a sense of fellowship yeah. there. And then yes. I think that's where... I'm learning to reach out to those women if I'm needing something or I need support, not help, support, and saying, hey, I'm having some issues with this, or hey, do you know someone who could help me with this? Um, so I think that's incredible. And I I have sort of become alive after being a part of this organization. And I've just realized, like, mm, this is, I fit here real well. Oh, that's beautiful. It really is. And, and you know, that's like our wine club is called The Swarm. And it's really more than just a wine club. It's a community, right? And it's a movement. It's people coming together and to, you know, to have great conversations and to support each other and to be part of, you know, this collective, um, you know, this collective group. And it's, uh, and it's, it's great because on my vineyard, there's dragonflies all over the place. And it's, you know, and for me, it's like when you see a dragonfly fly over, I like, I stop and talk to them because there's also a belief that, you know, dragonflies carry the spirit of others and mm -hmm. it's just, they're beautiful and they're so powerful. And, um, and I want every woman to feel powerful, you know, or to claim her own power and, um, and to feel supported and seen and felt and heard because so many of us aren't. And right. it's just, it's, and it's so, and, and that also starts with, you know, loving yourself. Um, but, you know, and that's been part of my own journey. I, I realized that I was always, always helping and supporting others. And I, I really, I had to, I had to even just work on my own lack of self-love and care. And, you know, I started to, to do a lot of chakra movement through Kundalini yoga. And it just really helped me finally, just really be in tune with my own body and my own spirit and all of that. And it's just, it's, you never stop learning and evolving. And I, and, you know, I'm 56 years old and I'm feeling better than I ever have. And, and I know I have so much more living to do and so much more impact to make in the world. And, you know, and I can't wait. I like, I wake up every day and I'm so grateful and blessed that I get to do what I love and love what I do and, um, and be around amazing people. And, and I look forward to who I'm, you know, who I'm going to meet today, right? Because that's the beauty of the wine industry. You get to meet new people all the time. And wow. it's awesome. So Couldn't be happy. quick little story. I was on a shoot yesterday, at Troon Vineyard out in the Applegate Valley in beautiful Southern Oregon. Um, they were there with um, some other team members working in their garden. They just kind of, they're putting in this beautiful garden and I'm in the greenhouse and a little baby dragonfly lands on my hand. Uh, yesterday, Jill, yesterday. Uh, right? Awesome. <laughs> and someone, I want my dragonfly for you right now. I here. know, I saw it. I saw your dragonfly. <laughs> but I mentioned it to someone. I was in the greenhouse. I'm like, you guys, look, dragonfly. And they go, ooh, you're magic. And I was like, I am magic. Yes, you are. I yes. just attracted this dragonfly on my hand. What do you oh, think for you, what do you think comes What's your first love? Is it wine or is it helping others? Uh, it's definitely, it's definitely, um, it's definitely helping others. I mean, I, 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 you know, I was brought up in a family that comes from a place of service. So, um, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm Jewish. And so tikkun olam was what I was taught as a kid, which is to repair the world and to leave it a better place than you found it. And right. before you can repair the world, you have to repair your community and before your community, your family. So I know that is me at the core. Um, I think wine, I just realized over time that my love of wine really stemmed from my love of people and connection mm. and, and service. And then realizing that, again, the, the best conversations I've ever had, there's been wine on the table. And so it just hit me like if I can harness the power of business for good and use wine as a conduit for change so that when we open a bottle, we open those necessary conversations. It just was like, it's like the perfect pairing. Um, and yes, there's great food with wine. But like for me, that was the perfect pairing of how do I want to spend my life and doing in a way where, uh, again, I mean, when I was younger, somebody asked uh, a good friend of the family said, you know, do what you love and the money will come. And I think I've been in search of that for a long time and I've absolutely found it where I am now. And um, it's, yeah, I, I'm, I feel very lucky. And, and, you know, it's being an entrepreneur is a, is a tough road. And, you know, I've, I've uh, 
you know, I, I, it's, you've got to be willing to sacrifice a lot, but it's worth it because I realized in this entrepreneurial cycle or journey that it's also, it's not stuff that's important to me. Right. Like, like that's not what fuels me. I love, don't get me wrong. I love great stuff. Right. And, um, but it's, but I realize that's not what fuels me. And, um, but I mean, doing this, like we're, we're going to be doing a cruise next year, a women owned, um, uh, travel agency reached out and said, do you want to be the wine host of a river cruise um, in Bordeaux? And yeah. we get to offer all of our wine club members. So if you, yeah. Um, and so it's like a seven day cruise it starts in Bordeaux, ends in Bordeaux. And, um, and I realized like I, that was something I want to do too. I want to travel for wine. So now every year we can do a different location in Europe and take people through amazing wine regions and, be on a river cruise. So if anything gets wrong, you can jump off and get to the <laughs> to land. <laughs> I can swim to that. Yes. So <laughs> I'll make I do it. not want to be stuck on a big cruise ship. I'm telling you that, but river cruises are luxurious and they're beautiful. <laughs> so <laughs> I've heard, I've heard they're pretty, they're pretty amazing. Um, if people are listening right now and they want to support Teneral sellers, what's the best way that they can? Uh, they should go to tenerallsellers.com. So T E N E R A L C E L L A R S, tenerallsellers.com. And, um, you know, you buy wine today, we ship today. So we have an amazing fulfillment house. Um, and then obviously next week, um, you know, or later this week, we'll, we'll own Wilderotter Vineyards and, um, and you can come and, and experience great stuff in Amador County. And, and we'll be posting all of that um, on our social media pages, but would love everybody to follow us too on Facebook yeah. and Instagram. Um, we, uh, you know, we have a nice presence. I have a great women owned team that does our social media and um, yeah, it's like, uh, yeah. And just subscribe because that's we get great content you. that we're always sticking out. So yeah. that's awesome. how I found you through Instagram. So love that. Um, And then, one kind of before we get to the final three, I want to wrap up a little bit. Do you think this new site that has come into your life now, this like perfect timing of this wonderful couple retiring and, and kind of here's this here's this business, here's this beautiful site. Do you think that is the universe going, nice job, Jill? Absolutely. Do you? Absolutely. You know what I think? I think I wholeheartedly believe that the universe – puts these opportunities in front of us. I do too. It's up to us though, to be present enough to see that. And, and, you know, there scotomas are blind spots and I'll never forget this. There was this training that I went to and they, 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 the host said, watch this video, count how many times the team in black passes the ball. So big movie comes on, you're focused so hard on how many times they pass the ball and then lights come up and he's like, how many times they pass the ball? And, and, you know, most people said this number, somebody said that number. And then he's like, how many of you saw the gorilla walking across the screen? And one person didn't, they probably actually saw the video already. And then he goes, watch it again. And then literally there was a, you know, a, a big man dressed in a gorilla outfit that walked across the screen, stopped in the middle of the screen and went, oh, you know, and then continued to walk right. and none of us saw it because we were so focused on the ball passing that we had these blind spots. And so you need to just be present and open because these opportunities are always there. It's like, you're just not paying attention. And yeah. so I'm, yeah, it, it, that's part of my growth journey of just being very present and uh, manifesting things. I, I, I look back and I've manifested so many things that I put up on my vision board. Um, and uh, it's really remarkable. And sometimes I just have to take a minute to say the power of energy and manifestation and all of that is it's real. It works. And um, so, yeah, I think this was, this was meant to be. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. And I almost, Almost didn't take a look. Stop watching balls. Exactly. <laughs> that should be a bumper drink, sticker. Drink more wine. Stop passing the balls. Yes. <laughs> Stop watching balls. Drink more wine. Um, what's your favorite of of everything that is made at Teneral Cellars? What's like number one for you? You know what? Right now it's our one in 10 white blend. Um, it's got peak pool, Grenache Blanc and Muscat, but it's really beautiful, dry and crispy. I mean, it's not sweet. I mean, people will hear Muscat and think it's sweet, sure. but we don't, because we sustainably, we don't add any sugar or concentrate in any of our wines, but that is a perfect porch pounder or pool pounder for the summer. And I don't think a man would make that wine. I mean, it's so, 
<laughs> it's such a beautiful blend that a female winemaker puts together. And so that's my favorite um, white right now. And then I really do love our, um, we have a, an amazing, um, well, I don't know, our, our, our overflowing with pride Barbera is spectacular, but our loud and proud Merlot, which we're both from our love is love collection that, that the Merlot from this region is spectacular and i know merlot got us such a bad rap with sideways but the merlot is is amazing so um i'm so and over our that. up here is great yeah. so i'm so yeah. over that it was a fine movie but it's just like i know I, merlot I know. is one of my absolute favorite varieties and i'm not ashamed to admit it well least. i'm going to send you a bottle of that then because it's it won a gold medal at the san francisco chronicle wine competition which is the most competitive in the u.s and it, it's an amazing merlot yeah well, I would invite you to come up to Southern Oregon and um, and taste all of the incredible wines we have up here. That That is our identity. Is so are you going to take me around if I come up there? Yeah, absolutely yes. I will. Yeah. Then yes. We are known for diversity as far as grape varieties go. 72 plus Love it. in this region. Love it. So Love it. I will. I will show you around. Uh, front row. Um, let's wrap up and get to the final three. Best advice you've ever been given. I'm going to go back to what I said earlier, which was do what you love and the money will come. Mm. The other thing is, I'm going to add one though, find your true self and you will find your true people. Ooh, that's good, Jill. That's real good. I like the do what you love and the money will come because that's, I needed to hear that today, just in the last two years of transition for me. So, and now again, I'm not, I'm not concerned. I'm like you, not about stuff, right? But it is, it is a stressor at times. Like, what am I going to do? How am I going to contribute? And I want to contribute to my community, but I also want to make sure my dogs are taken care of. <laughs> so yes. yeah, I needed to hear that today. Um, what's your happy place? In the vineyard. Mm. Doing what? Working, walking, looking? Anything. Honestly, anything. I, I, when I'm, I mean, I could stare at my window right now and see the vineyard. Um, it's just, it's mother nature at its best. I just feel like, um, you know, it reminds me to just stop and appreciate the beauty in the world and not to take anything for granted. Mm -hmm. And I love that. I hear this a lot from my winemaker buddies that it's one time you get one chance every year to make the most out of these vines that mother nature yeah. gives you. And I love that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. In all things food and drink, what do you crave? <laughs> well, anything with truffles. <laughs> yes. I mean, come on, right? Truffle fries. Yeah. That's my anything, death row meal. Anything. Seriously. You had me a truffle. Um, yes. yeah, yeah. So I crave that. Um, I'm definitely a salty and savory girl. I'm not I'm not a, I'm not really a big dessert, um, person. Although I, I mean, I'll, I'll take, I will always have dessert, especially if it's paired with a great dessert wine, but I definitely salty and savory. Um, I love popcorn. Um, truffle popcorn. <laughs> I know, right. Just put truffle on it. There you go. So, um, and I really, I really, really love an amazing charcuterie board, although I don't eat meat, but, and, and, uh, but boy, cheese, manchego cheese, or like an amazing Gouda with a cap. I mean, oh goodness, mm -hmm. yes, cheese, yeah. truffle cheese. Yeah, I would prefer to just- Truffle cheese, yes. truffle cheese. <laughs> just like graze and snack and drink wine. That's how yes. I function. I don't need a yes. meal, just grazing and snacking. Totally, totally. Um, Jill Ogier, you've been so fun. So have you. Thank you. Well, Thanks for having me. Thank you for being here. Thank you for sharing your heart and your brain. I'm so excited for, um, especially my female listeners who um, frequently will say, I loved that interview or I love that interview. I'm very excited for them to hear this one because I feel like you're going to say something that someone needs to hear today. And that's why I do these interviews. I just mm -hmm. love it. Thank you. Thank so, you. That's so kind. Um, Teneral Sellers, if you want any information um, about Jill or Teneral Sellers, you can just go to teneralsellers.com, correct? Okay. Correct. Jill Ozier, thank you so much for being here once again. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. 
been listening to Hungry for More, an Epicurean's Dilemma with me, Trish Glose. Today's episode sponsored by Tap and Vine 559, the place to eat, meat, and drink in Southern Oregon. You can watch this podcast and subscribe on my YouTube channel. Just search Hungry for More. You can also listen and subscribe wherever you like to listen to podcasts.